Hey, Doug. Hey, Mo. How are you? Great. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Smart Training 365. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, it's a new video. Uh, this channel is about resistance training, uh, exercise analysis, uh, physiology, everything you need to know about training. So if you have any questions, don't forget to send it to us in the comment section. So, Doug, today we're going to talk a little bit about um, muscle fibers. We always talk to people and tell them about um, you have to always follow the direction of the fibers, but some people don't know that um, what's the direction of the fiber. Uh, I looked online. I don't see many videos about this subject. I saw videos about the type of muscle, which is like a fast twitch muscle, slow twitch muscle, but not the muscle fibers. So I want to show you these muscles and we can maybe uh, elaborate more and understand what's the role and pros and cons of each one. And, and of course, this is in our course and it's in my book. Right. It is more in depth. Right. The first type of muscle is a parallel muscle and it's in the sartorius and the rectus abdominis. Right. Well, the first thing I'll tell you is that technically these fiber types are categorically known as muscle architecture. Um, and there's, there's seven types of muscle architecture. Um, and then for the time being, let's just say that there's two broad categories and then a single one all by itself. Right. The two broad ones are called parallel and the other is called pennate. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we're talking about here is muscle fibers that run in a straight line from origin to insertion. Those would be called the parallel fibers and the pennate muscle fibers are muscles that fibers that do not run the same direction as the origin and the insertion of the fiber. They cross hatch. So when you see convergent there on the pectoralis major, those are still parallel fibers. They're called convergent because, you know, they basically take a broad number of these fibers and they converge into, you know, a smaller bundle. But they're still parallel. They're still side by side. So when you're talking about a pennate fiber, you're talking about muscles that run diagonally from origin to insertion. So, um, and the reason that happens is because um, you can pack more muscle fibers into a smaller space. Mm -hmm. Just like if you are parking cars on the street, sometimes you see diagonal parking, right? You can park more cars diagonally than you can parallel to each other. So um, you, it, the reason why evolution has uh, allowed certain fibers to be pennate, crosshatch like that, is because those muscles are always on extension muscles, like a tricep or, or a quadricep. And the reason for that is because those muscles always pull from what is called the mechanical disadvantage, which means that every time that muscle fiber contracts, it pulls on its limb parallel to the limb. Now, if you're talking about a bicep or a pectoral, um, those are parallel to each other because they don't experience mechanical disadvantage all the time. They experience it sometimes, but sometimes they experience mechanical advantage which basically means the opportunity to pull on its limb from a mostly parallel, uh, excuse me, perpendicular angle. And so that means that like, if, for example, your bicep, you could ask yourself, what, what, did, what did a bicep evolve to do, right? Well, more, more, than, more than likely, they evolved to carry things with your elbows bent. Like if you were gonna carry a rock or you were gonna carry something, we, you know, early humans probably used their biceps more with their elbows bent than with their elbows straight. And so that meant that when the bicep is pulling on the form from a per perpendicular angle, it requires less force than it requires when your bicep is pulling on your forearm when your elbow is straight. So that's why it didn't require as much uh, unusual amount of, of contractile force as the tricep would experience or the quadricep would experience. Now, in my book, I, I compare this to your bicycle. If you have, you look at your, your, your let's say, 10-speed bicycle, and you look at, you know, how there's gears, right? And there's small gears, and there's, and there's big gears. Well, the big wheels, right, turn fewer times 
in order for one revolution, but the smaller ones turn more, right? So, so that means you're, you're, you're trading power for distance. So the less distance you have to travel, the more power you can generate. The more distance you have to travel, the less power you can generate. So, so that's what, pen, what a pennate muscle basically is. And the reason I explained it in my book is because it's, it's tempting sometimes to look at, let's say, the latissimus fibers mm -hmm. and say, this is the way the latissimus fibers run. It should be the direction of the resistance. Well, that's fine. And that's true. But then you might say, well, how come I can't do the same thing with a tricep or with a quadricep? And then I say, well, that's true that you can do it, but you can still draw a straight line from the origin and the insertion. Mm -hmm. And that would tell you the direction of anatomical movement, as well as the direction of resistance that you should use. This last one on the right here, by the way, the circular, yep. um, that's the mouth and the anus. <laughs> yeah. And so that's obviously not relevant to what we talk about. Yeah. Um, anything like uh, a parallel fiber or a pennate fiber. That's why it's got its own category. Yeah. So um, do all these muscle fiber has the same uh, strength capacity? No, in, in fact, that's, that's the whole point is that, but here's where it gets confusing for a person who doesn't quite understand what strength capacity is. So um, you would say, well, if the triceps are crosshatched, then the triceps should be stronger than the biceps. Mm -hmm. And that would be demonstrated by the amount of weight you're moving. And so you'd say, well, how come I can curl 30 pound dumbbell, but I can only extend a 30 pound dumbbell also. If the tricep is a stronger muscle, why can't I lift more than 30 pounds? And the reason is because when you're doing a tricep extension, that 30 pounds is magnified more because of the mechanical disadvantage, right? So if you did the math on it, you would find out that the 60 pounds, excuse me, the 30 pounds tricep extension might actually be 60 or 90 pounds to the triceps because of the fact that it has to pull, I wouldn't say 60 or 90 pounds, but I would say two or three times more because we have to account for yeah. the length of the forearm. Mm -hmm. But it could be two, three, four times more force that the muscle has to generate because of the fact that it can only pull on that forearm from a mostly parallel angle rather than a perpendicular angle, as would be the case in the bicep. Right. So um, who else need to know about the muscle direction? Does the person who wants to, uh, let's say, maximize their muscle growth in the gym, will this information help them in their uh, exercise selection? Um, no, but yes. <laughs> what I mean by that is it will not, this information will not help you build a bigger muscle but this information will help you avoid an injury. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because um, a pennate muscle, an extension muscle um, is far less likely to tear than a parallel muscle fiber or a flexion muscle. So when you think about the most common muscle tears, you always hear about a bicep tear. You always hear about a pectoral tear and you always hear about a hamstring tear. Guess what? Those are all flexion muscles. Those are all parallel fibers. And that's because there's a bigger difference between the amount of force that muscle has to generate when that joint is bent versus when that joint is straight. So if I'm going to straighten my arm like this, the amount of force my bicep has to generate when, my, when it's pulling parallel to my forearm could be nine or 10 times more. So that's why a preacher curl is so dangerous is because, you know, you're letting that arm go straight or almost straight. And yet, when you do a standing curl, for example, it's going straight or almost straight, but at the same time, that forearm is going into a neutral position. So the fact that you're increasing mechanical disadvantage, but decreasing the resistance works, protects that bicep tendon. But if you were to put your arm on a tabletop, let's say you wanted to, and I don't <laughs> encourage you to do this because this could, it's almost guaranteed mm -hmm. to cause an injury. If you put your arm on a tabletop, with let's say a 50 or a 60 or a 70 pound dumbbell in your hand and you lowered it down slowly and then try to bring it back up again, you'd almost guarantee a bicep tendon tear because you're entering mechanical disadvantage at the exact same time that the, the, the forearm lever is entering its more increased resistance position. 
So you have two um, magnifiers of resistance happening at the same time. So that's why we have to be careful when we're using um, heavy, heavy weight and we're going into full elongation of the muscle. That's why a TRX leg curl, especially a one leg mm -hmm. TRX leg curl could be so dangerous is because when that lower leg gets perpendicular to that TRX, it's maximally increasing its force on the hamstring. And that's happening at the same time that the knee is going almost straight, which is more mechanical disadvantage. So, you know, and, and to make matters worse, not only would you tear a hamstring or could you tear a hamstring um, doing something like that, but the only thing then at that point, keeping that leg from doubling back from hyperextending is the tendons. Mm -hmm. So if you were to rip a hamstring in that most open position, and there's no muscle then to keep it from going farther, you could also then tear some tendons, some knee tendons. Right. We talked about uh, that muscle are, this is a different subject. Uh, we talked about muscle that are uh, early phase loaded. I mean, sorry, exercises that should be early phase loaded and late uh, and at the end less resistant. Right. Some muscle will not have that. For example, if we do shrugs, okay. At the end of the movement, the resistance is the same. Uh, if we do, for example, calf raises, the resistance is the same. So uh, I don't know also about the rear deltoid. It can have also increased resistance at the end. So are these exception to the rules? The answer, the answer is yes. And, and the answer is more than just a yes, that it's... it's um there's not a lot of consistency across all the different types of muscle. For example, the bicep is significantly more vulnerable to a bicep tear when you load the mechanical disadvantage portion of that range of motion as compared to the pecs. Pectoral tears are far less common than bicep tears, even though when you're doing a dumbbell press, you're getting mechanical disadvantage. So, that's an that's a very very good example of how they don't necessarily have the same risk or the same um um resistance or strength curve yeah so um now if you were if you were looking at someone doing a standing calf raise from the side what you would see is that the ankle is in the middle of the foot right and this is the heel right and this is the toes right so the calf is pulling on the heel bone right? And it's making it go up and down because it's pulling on the heel bone. So the changing angle of the heel relative to the pull of the, so you are getting some variation, but you're never going to zero and you're never mm -hmm. going, you're going through the hundred percent position. So you're right. It's not the way a bicep is, right? In fact, the ankle calf is a completely different type of lever yeah. than a, than, than a bicep is, than an elbow bicep is. Um, and, and so, not always can you do early phase loading um, very easily or at all. And then in those cases, I would just, you know, not just, I would tell you, just do it the way it, it can only be done. Right. Mm -hmm. But, but um, I, I always encourage people to experiment. So for example, I would say it is absolutely dangerous to early phase load a bicep because of mechanical disadvantage. Right. Even, even if you didn't have your arm on the tabletop, even a 45 degree angle, is dangerous. And that's because the mechanical disadvantage actually creates its own magnifier. So you're already getting a type of early phase loading just from the mechanical disadvantage that's occurring at the beginning of the range of motion. So that can't be ignored. That is in fact a magnifier of force. So even if your form is mostly parallel with gravity, you're still getting magnification of force. That's why biceps tear during deadlift. Mm -hmm, right. Yeah. The, the, the forearm is almost parallel to gravity, but it doesn't take more than about a, a five degree angle of the forearm combined with the amount of weight you're trying to deadlift combined with that mechanical disadvantage to cause a bicep tear. And in my book and in you can Google this or YouTube it, you can find lots and lots of examples of people tearing their bicep during a deadlift. And it's always the, the, the hand that has the palm out. It's never the hand that has the palm back. Right. So, and that's because when your palm is back like that, you're not in a position to curl. Once mm -hmm. you're like this, you're, you're, you're going to be tempted subconsciously to try to use anything you can to get that weight up. And so you're going to start pulling with that arm. Mm -hmm. um, 
So, but what I always tell people is you can experiment with, let's say a tricep kickback and a skull crusher, right? So you can see that if you do a tricep kickback, you cannot nearly do as much weight as you can on a skull crusher. Why? Because on a skull crusher, your early phase is loaded and the end phase is lighter. Here, the end phase has nothing and the end phase is heaviest, mm -hmm. right? So, so you, you need to experiment and you need to acknowledge that the better exercise is the one that allows you to use more weight comfortably. Mm -hmm. That would be the skull crusher. That means you're, you're creating a, a situation where the resistance curve of the exercise and the strength curve of the muscle are more in sync with each other. You're giving the muscle more what it can handle when it can handle it. And you're giving the muscle less resistance later when it can't handle as much. That's perfect. If you load the end phase, which is the weak phase of that range of motion, then you're depriving the early phase, which is arguably the more valuable, the more productive part of the range of motion. Mm -hmm. And does that um, like reduce the amount of muscle growth in these particular muscle as compared to the other muscle where we, you can have early phase loading? Well, you know, here, here's the thing that I think fools a lot of people is people think that if it's hard mm -hmm. at the end of the range of motion, that that guarantees growth. And they've done an EMG study where they show that a tricep kickback, you know, creates muscle activation. Okay, but muscle activation isn't all the same, yeah. right? So we know that the early, the first third, the first half of the range of motion, and this has been shown, is always stronger and is always more productive. That's why a lot of times you see some of the pro bodybuilders and they just do the first half of the range of motion. They don't even finish the rep. Now, some of that might be instinctive. Some of that might be just kind of their instinct telling them that that's where, you know, the best part of the movement is, or it might be that they've read, a, a, you know, some report on it. But, but the point is that just because a tricep kickback is hard at the weak part of the range of motion doesn't mean that that's going to somehow complement mm -hmm. the other exercise that you just did that's early phase loaded. So doing the two doesn't necessarily produce a better benefit than just doing the one that's early phase loaded hard for its own sake isn't necessarily productive right um last time someone said if i stay in the sun will i lose my gain my muscle gain yes if he stays in the sun will he lose his muscle gain or will he burn more calories like that and lose his muscle gain Wow, that's a bizarre question. I mean, and the reason I say it's bizarre is because uh, we've never heard of a connection between lying in the sun and metabolism or protein synthesis or anything. I mean, we have heard of people asking, can I gain muscle while I'm doing cardiovascular exercise? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that may, there's, a, there's a logical correlation there, right? But there isn't necessarily a logical correlation between the sun. I, I would say it's the opposite. I would say that, um, and by the way, you know, most of us that have read, you know, historical accounts of the early days of bodybuilding, Arnold Schwarzenegger and those guys oh, yeah. all spent day all day sun. at the beach, right? And of course, they were not small. So we can always use that as, a, as, a, as empirical evidence. But, but I would say that my experience has been that when I lie in the sun, um, A, I feel better, meaning I feel more muscular. B, um, it feels, it looks like I'm getting leaner and bigger, or maybe it's just the fact that when you are tan, you do look bigger and feel leaner. And, you know, that's the reason why we use artificial tan in bodybuilding competitions is because when you're pale, you don't look as muscular, you don't look as hard, lean, you don't look as big. Um, so I, it's, it's hard to tell whether it's an illusion or whether it's some kind of psychosomatic thing but but i tend to believe that there's 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 health healthful benefits to uv exposure that causes you to lose maybe some of the water in your skin um and and of course makes the skin feel a little tighter um and that maybe the d the vitamin d that's from the sun maybe also sort of gives you a little bit of a, a boost it's not a big boost it's, but it, but i would definitely say it does not hurt you yeah yeah maybe it's the excess of uh, sweat if a person sweats a lot they think that 
they are losing calories. Losing yeah, weight. I suppose. I mean, the first thing I would say is, you know, you don't want to lie in the sun so much that you have heat exhaustion. Yeah, yeah. Right. So it's true that if you over sweat and you get heat exhaustion, that your health will decline a bit. <laughs> right. So you don't want to do that. Yeah. Hey, Andrew, happy birthday again. If you're watching, happy birthday. He probably is watching. Happy birthday, Andrew. <laughs> yes. Do you have any questions? that uh, people asked you or anything? Uh, let's see here. What are people asking me? You know, they asked me a lot of questions and a lot of them are sort of funny, like, where do I buy a hip extension machine in the UK? It's like, how am I supposed to know that? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. No, I mean, I, you know, I think, I think that, you know, our, our biggest hurdle is for people to understand that, you know, the amount of resistance that a muscle experiences is not exclusively related to the amount of weight that you're actually lifting. Mm. So that's, that's the thing that people have a hard time wrapping their head around. Even, even though you can, you can show them the physics and even though you can show them that say, let's say a sissy squat with 200 pounds of body weight will load your quadriceps with 1200 pounds of force. Whereas a barbell squat, if you weigh 200 pounds and you have 200 pounds on the bar will only load your quadriceps with about 950 pounds of resistance. And even they have, first of all, they have to take your word for it that you're doing the math, right? But, but, you know, we have engineers on our team that, that, that help us calculate this. Yeah. And so there's no doubt that you are getting more muscle loading in your quadricep with a sissy squat than you are with a 200 pound barbell squat. Um, it's still hard for people to wrap their head around the fact that the exercise, it doesn't require additional weight. Yeah. Will cause more loading than the one that does use additional weight. So, um, uh, yeah, I think, and I also think that people sort of conflate um, the the beast mode effect. They think that by lifting a heavier amount of weight that feels heavier in the gym must, quote unquote, load the muscle more. But mm -hmm. from a from a physics and a mechanical standpoint, that can easily be proven false. Yeah, it's just not true. Um, and 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 then someone would say, well, yeah, but nobody's won any bodybuilding contest yet doing only sissy squats. Yeah. And I would say, well, yes, that's, that's true because this has now only recently been revealed, right? Eventually we think there will be people that understand the logic of this enough to do only the efficient exercises mm -hmm. and then they'll start appearing on stage. So if, if that's the only kind of proof that works for you, then you'll have to wait and see, right? But right. Th those of us that are much more logical thinkers and those of us, by the way, who, you know, are willing to experiment, Right. If you're willing to experiment, you're willing to, to, to try some cable sissy squats in the gym and then compare how your quads feel to how they feel after doing barbell squats. Yeah. There's then now you'll have a visceral understanding yeah. of what we're talking about. But yeah. until you're until you're willing to try it, you're going to say, ah, oh, well, I don't believe it. It's like, all right, well, we don't care if you believe it or not. It's not our loss if you choose to not believe it. Right. It might be your loss, not only in terms of possible muscle gain, but in terms of injury prevention if you don't give it a try, but you know, what, what can it hurt to give it a try? Right. They can find more details uh, about how to set up the sissy squat uh, in the book, the physics of right. resistance exercise, uh, or in the uh, new brick 20 videos that will be released next week, I'll say in the next 10 days. And you will really like this one because there will be a 3D simulation. There will be a breakdown of the anatomy. Uh, you will see the exercise from all angles. Uh, so you will not really be confused on how you will be positioning your body or anything like that. So it will be very helpful. You will also find a video where uh, you'll see Doug and I uh, going through the workout, uh, going through the intensity uh so that's a good video too and there will be another video that is called the, the break 20 um alternatives where you will see the first second third fourth sixth best you know depending uh, on the, the exercise optional exercises yeah of the optional exercises with videos to uh, demonstrate how you set up those options and also knowing the value of each of each uh, option so uh oh, so mo one more thing yeah um, so people have been asking, how did we meet and, and, and in what are, 
uh, respective contributions are to this collaboration? Oh, okay. And I so, think that's a good question. Sure. Uh, well, I watched your video like everyone on Rick Drace, right? And um, the physics of fitness was every time like you finish that um, episode with him, you say, if you want more, check out the physics of resistance exercise. And I did from the beginning, you know, and I was fascinated with uh, the information because I've been a tennis player and a tennis coach all my life. And I worked out all my life. Like since I was 16 years old, I've been going to the gym. Uh, and I always wanted to know, like, what are, is there really a good exercise for a particular muscle? Like what is the best for, let's say, biceps or triceps? Or, and most of the videos that I found online uh, on YouTube was exercises that people preferred. Like they tell you, okay, this is what I do for my triceps. Do it this way, do it that way. But they didn't say why it's the best exercise. Like I want to know like scientifically why it's good. Okay. And uh, even the programs, you will see a combination of exercises. And the purpose of that is the pump and get you exhausted at the end to feel that, wow, that's really a kick-ass workout, you know? I, I did those things, you know? And that's why I was fascinated when I read the physics of fitness because I tried many things and now I know the difference. You know, if someone didn't try it, he will say, oh no, this is not the right one. But when you try like compound, you try um, carol bells, you try power lifting, you know, all that, you will know the different value of each exercise. So I had to contact you and I'm a certified personal trainer along with tennis coach. And I told you, okay, Doug, I really want to invite you in Toronto to do a seminar. And at that time you didn't have the book ready and stuff. Wasn't so, published yet. Yeah, it wasn't published yet. So we, we stayed connected for a few years. But then I had to reach out again and I asked you if we uh, can do this, uh, if, we can, if we can make it an online course. And that's how, yeah, certification program, because I thought that this knowledge has to uh, reach like the whole world. To be honest, like uh, as a personal trainer, I found it very helpful, especially if I care about my client and I want to be successful, I want to give them the best. And what makes it uh, the best is the knowledge. If you combine your experience plus your knowledge plus what you believe in, uh, I think you will succeed in this uh, job. So um, yeah, after the, the, the certification program, the rest is history. Like we created more content. We well, yeah, created... we, just, we just kept, we kept thinking of ways to, um, to help more people hear the message because it's such a valuable message. It's such a essential message, really. I mean, if you if you're involved in resistance exercise and you don't know these things, guaranteed, you're wasting time, you're wasting effort, and you're risking injury. Guaranteed. Yeah. Um, I, I'll give you one example of what was always shocked me. You know, is that people don't ask enough questions. True. They just don't wonder what they should wonder about logically when they're lifting weights. So um, let's just say you're going to do an upright row. Yeah. Right? You're pulling upward against a downward resistance. That's working something. For the moment, let's not identify what it's working, but you know you're pulling in an upward direction. Now let's look at a pull down. Resistance is pulling up, you're pulling down. Mm-hmm. Now, let's say you're doing a row, it's pulling frontward, you're pulling backward. Mm -hmm. So the logical question someone should ask is, what happens when I go everything in between? Here, 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 right? Now, obviously, those five, six, seven different moves don't all work the same muscle. No. The question everyone should be asking is, at what point does it change from one to another and why? Right? At what point? Right? And 
it's not a matter of guesswork. It's a matter of physics. It's a matter of opposite position loading. It's a matter of uh, anatomy. So we say pull downs work the lats, okay? Rowing works the lats. Wait a minute. The same muscle gets worked with two different directions of pull? Well, no, actually they don't. Not to the same degree, not nearly to the same degree, right? Because the origins of the lats are on the lower two thirds of the spine yeah. and the insertion is higher on the arm, which means the lats pull in a downward direction, downward and inward, right? So if you row, that's not as good, right? It's not nearly as good. Not only that, but when you're pulling down, the elbows are not going behind your back. But when you're going like this, they are going behind your back. And the lats can't pull your arms behind your back because they stop at your spine. I mean, if I'm the spine and I'm holding the lat fiber, that arm's going to go right by me. How can it yeah. go by me if I'm pulling toward my spine? Right? So these are logical questions that people should be asking. And there's absolute unequivocal clarity in the answers we provide. Yeah. This is how you know what's working. This is how you know what's loaded. Here's why. Same thing with, like, if you say, okay, here's an overhead press. Here's an incline press. Here's a flat press, okay? Clearly, the flat press is considered a chest exercise. The incline press historically has been considered a, a chest exercise. Overhead press has not. Logical question. At what point did that change? If this was chest and this was still chest, at what point does it shoulders. become not chest, right? Okay, so what's the rule? Muscles always pull toward their origins. Yeah. Well, hello, if all muscles pull toward the origins, that means when you're going straight, you're already going to the highest part of the chest. When you start pushing at an incline, you're going toward your chin. There's no pectoral muscle there. Now you're going upward. Clark, there's no pectoral muscle up there either, right? But you're also not doing quite what the shoulder is designed to do. Mm -hmm. Right. And so this is all explained very clearly. What is the shoulder design, shoulder joint design? What is the, the what is the motion that's created when muscles are pulling toward their origin here versus there? Yeah. You know, what is the, the, the physics rule about opposite position loading, the line of force? All of these things clearly explain which exercises are better and which exercises are worse. Yeah. And so to have someone say, all exercises are good that there is no best exercise is ridiculous. I heard somebody say that someone recently posted, and this is, by the way, is an exercise physiologist. There is no best exercise. It's all a matter of individuality. It's like, so that means that an overhead press might work my chest. That means that an upright row might work my lats. No, physics determines the, that these things don't. Physics determines these things. Anatomy determines these things, right? There is a best, and there is a second, third, fourth, fifth best, less good, less good, less good, based on the direction of anatomical motion and the direction of resistance. It's absolutely clear. It's absolutely logical. It's like the idea that you would say there is no best exercise is ridiculous. It means there's no rules, and there are rules. F full range of motion is generally better than partial range of motion, yeah. right? Early phase losing is generally better than late phase. I mean, these are absolute rules. The 16 right? so, Brignolian principles. That's why we, made, yes. we add them to the... And, and that's what everyone seems to sort of be missing is that you have to say this is a good exercise because it, it complies with these principles. Yeah. This isn't a good exercise because it fails these seven principles or these three principles, right? So you can't just make sort of a random decision about an exercise. You have to first identify the rules. What are the rules? What are the principles that need to be complied with? Just like if you were looking at the flight worthiness of an airplane, why isn't this a good flight worthy airplane? Because it violates these principles, these aviation principles, right? It's the same thing with resistance same exercise. Applies. It's all mechanical. So, yeah. so this is why, and I agree with you, this is why it's so critically important that this information get out there because without it, it's just a free for all. Without it, it's just a, a matter of people's opinions and people following random opinions without any coordination of rules without any principles to follow. It's like, no, this, this is all dictated by principles. Right. Um, to be honest, um, that's why I also 
wanted to create with you this channel, Smart Training 365 YouTube channel, because I want this channel to be the go-to when they need uh, resistance training advice, you know, because I've been to different channels. I found exercise suggestions, but there's no solid reasoning or scientifically uh, proven um, answer to what they are saying, you know? So this was the most comprehensive and easiest way for me to understand. And that's why, like, I'm from Tunisia. My first language is Arabic. Second language is French. Uh, English is my 10th language. No, actually, you're doing, third you're, language. You're doing, you're doing very you know? well. <laughs> so, uh, so if I understood it, like, people will understand it for sure, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, well, look, yeah. there, are, there, are, there are people out there that are, and again, you know, I, I hate to say this because I don't want to sound critical and I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes um, or embarrass anyone um, or anything, you know, remotely like that. But, but there are people out there that are trying to convey that their program is scientific, scientifically based, scientifically sound, evidence-based. We hear all these words, biomechanics, this, biomechanics, that. You know, and it doesn't mean it is. They won't, you know, they, re they recognize that that sounds more convincing, that it sounds more provable. But, but you know, I like, for example, I just saw someone post this, um, this alteration to an exercise. He was talking about how an overhead press um, is not as good as bringing your elbow slightly forward and going up. Now, there were a couple of little uh, clues. This person was pretending to have scientific information, but it wasn't, right? So he had an overhead uh, drawing and he drew a line from the shoulder joint forward and he drew another line from the side. And this line here said sagittal plane. And then this line here said frontal plane. Isn't frontal you, the front? Well, that's what I'm saying is the, the first clue, anyone, even without having scientific knowledge would say, well, why is that one called the frontal and not this one? Mm -hmm. Well, you can look it up. That is the frontal plane. This is the sagittal plane, right? Sagittal means you're dividing the, the body in half and, the, yeah. and it's a left side, right side. Yeah. The frontal plane is dividing it like this front and back, right? So, so right away, the terminology was even wrong, right? And he was suggesting that the space in between the front, the frontal and the sagittal um, was the safer more effective way to do the overhead press. And it is safer in part, slightly safer by the way, because if you're on the side and you go up, you're more likely to have your humerus run into your acromion process and squeeze the supraspinatus tendon and the subacromial bursa in between when you're here versus when you're in front. But his rationale was it lets you bring the arm lower, which lets the side deltoid get more elongated. Well, that's true, but the side delta is now on the side. In other words, when you're going up, what's mostly on top, mm -hmm. on the opposite side of the downward resistance is the front deltoid, which means opposite position loading is the rule. The line of force is through the front deltoid, not through the side deltoid. So it doesn't matter that the side deltoid comes lower because it's not loaded. So you're not gonna get better. And then he actually did it on a slight incline, which of course made the side deltoid go farther to the side. So this is an example of how you might see something that sounds scientific, mm -hmm. but it doesn't take much dissection to see, well, he's not even calling the sagittal and in, 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 in frontal planes the, the, the correct thing. But he's obviously ignoring the, the one of the 16 principles, which is opposite position loading. The muscle is not positioned on the opposite direction of the resistance, which is essential for loading. So um, again, we're, our, our goal is to never name names and we're not here to try to you know, make anyone feel, you know, bad, um, nor are we actually here to, you know, make anyone lose an audience, but, but we are here focused on, on the consumers, right? And, yeah. and, and I don't like the consumer being misinformed. Um, and, and some people send me videos with something that someone is, is preaching and it's, it's not correct and go, can you check out this video and comment on it? It's like, well, no, I can't because I can't do this on a one-on-one -on -one basis.
I can't take everybody's assignment. Here, look at this video, look at this video. Like I'll be looking at videos all day long that people send me and then what? Commenting individually to the, no, it's just too much work. I mean, we try to do that here yeah. on our channel where we will you know, try to address the misinformation that's being put out there. But again, never putting a name on it. You know, we don't, we don't want to make anyone feel bad. That's not our objective. But unfortunately, it's kind of a two-edged sword. If you, if you say this exercise isn't particularly good, then you might say, well, the person who told that to me then is wrong. It's like, well, that's not the objective here. The objective yeah. is, to, is to understand what's, what works better and why. That's the objective. If you know that there are people who are looking for this information, who wants to uh, educate themselves, refer them to this channel. Help us grow, help, help us spread the information because without your support, we are not gonna grow. So I hope we are helping you with uh, what we are doing here. Uh, send us your suggestions. Uh, if you want to get the physics of resistance exercise, you can go to uh, dougbrignoli.com. Uh, Doug Brignoli is the author. We're having the author every week for you, twice a week, tell you about um, different things. And if you uh, want to uh, become certified in our program, check out the physics of resistance exercise. Uh, and you can also wait for the Brick 20 updated video. These videos are going to be revolutionary. I can tell you that. I watched many programs and I know what they have. And these are going to be different. So thank you very much, Doug. And I will much. see you in the next video. Okay, sounds good. Thank you.